so a little bit of a uh, kind of a nightly routine at my house lately is uh, one of the guys in the Wi-Fi community gave me an original Nintendo, you know, 1985, right? The good old original Nintendo. And I revived it and got it working again. And my daughters, uh, ages four, five, and seven, they love to watch me play Zelda 1 on it. Anybody play Zelda 1 back in the day? Anybody? Like three guys did, four guys did? Nice, yeah. So every night we've been going up, we spend a couple hours playing Zelda 1, and they just love that. Good old 8-bit graphics. So I'm on Dungeon 4 right now. It's throwing us for a loop, but we'll get it. We'll get it at some point. Well, uh, my name is Joel, and uh, I am the technical training manager at, uh, at Ekahau, and uh, I am CWNE number, uh, number 233, uh, and I am also uh, CWNP number one. That is uh, Certified Wireless Network Potato, since I'm from Idaho. So, uh, hey, Nico, can you, can you actually get CWNP.com? Can you go to domain.com and buy that domain for me? I, I think it's available, it should be available, right? So yeah, you'll take care of that for me. I don't think anybody else would have that domain. Uh, one thing I do strongly recommend, you've probably figured this out already if you're at this conference, but if you can, try to get on Twitter and get involved with the community there. It's an excellent place to get involved and learn more about Wi-Fi. I would say probably 60% of what I know, uh, it, just kind of like general day-to-day -day stuff uh, in Wi-Fi comes from Twitter. So I can't recommend uh, getting involved in that community enough. So. I want to start by, by talking about community. I want to open this up by talking about community. And I want to talk about how, uh, how the Wi-Fi community has impacted me and my family in a really, really big way. Basically, I want to, I want to take this opportunity to, to say thank you for something that the wireless community did for me. Uh, about two years ago, we found out that my sister-in-law, Mercy, she was 13 years old last year, we found out that she had a severe case of scoliosis, which is curvature of the spine. And uh, this is very problematic. Her, her family, you know, they, they always set aside money and they're always prepared for emergencies and things like that. But this was gonna be a really, a really difficult problem to tackle. Uh, if you look at her back here, let me annotate a little bit here so you can kind of see what's going on here. If you look at her back, she's standing as level as she can in this photo. And she's 13 years old in this, in this photo. Uh, you can see her shoulders there. You can see this bulge over on the side. Uh, and uh, if you take a look at the x-ray here. So let me just kind of show you what was going on with Mercy's back here. So if we, if we outline her spine, so we kind of go up here towards the top, and, uh, and then you can see how it's not just a curve. It, it's almost a roller coaster. So let's just outline the whole thing here. You can see how it's almost a corkscrew. So, her back, her spine was in excess of 100 degrees. In fact, there were two curves in total. So the solution to this problem, the typical solution is to do what's called fusing. So they fuse all of your vertebrae together. Uh, as she grew up, she would have experienced a tremendous pain. Uh, she would not have been able to have children and she would not be able to put on her own socks. That's the solution. And her parents decided that that's, that's just not good enough. That, that's not enough for their daughter. And so uh, the, the solution was a $100,000 surgery that was absolutely not covered by insurance. And lots of people would say like, oh yeah, no, no, there's, there's ways to come on, you know, you guys can get figured. No, no, they tried every option and there was absolutely no getting around this. It's, it was an experimental surgery uh, in which instead of fusing her vertebrae together, they used tethers. They put screws down her spine and basically put in bungee cords that hold it in place. And so that gives her mobility so she can move around, put on socks, things like that, be a normal human being, but have a relatively straight back, but we needed $100,000. And the problem is that we only had about six months to get it. Time was running out. Uh, the doctor said, you need to have this surgery completed by October of 2017, or we cannot do the surgery at all. And they had to have all the money up front. So literally, time is running out. I watched as all of my in-laws, they all slashed their budgets, they sold stuff, they did fundraisers, they did anything that they could to get together money for Mercy surgery. And one thing that I was amazed about is when we started fundraising for this is how the Wi-Fi community stepped up in a really big way. 
a, a Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi community stepped up and helped fund this surgery. We saw all kinds of different sources come in. We saw, uh, we saw people just straight up give money. I, I can't even begin to calculate how much money was given. Some of the, some of the, the donations had names on them. Some of them were anonymous. And so we, we can't possibly know exactly what the Wi-Fi community gave us. But it was a lot. They also contributed airline miles, hotel points, and thoughts and prayers, all kinds of stuff. In fact, uh, the, uh, the airfare all the way over to New York from Boise, Idaho, where we live, was completely covered by the Wi-Fi community because they took care of it with, uh, with uh, airline miles. So I just wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you to the wireless community and uh, uh, just kind of a little bit of a follow-up for what happened. Mercy's doing great, although uh, she actually went back in for her second surgery yesterday. So this is kind of a follow-up surgery. They went back through and tightened up a few things. Her parents uh, thought it was pretty funny that she had a couple of screws loose. So they said, yeah, Mercy's got a few screws loose. No surprise. Uh, but they, uh, they were able to get that corrected from 100 degrees down to 30. So big, big, uh, big, big difference there. So I just wanted to say thanks. And, uh, and I would also encourage you to check out the, the fundraiser that uh, Keith's family's got going on right now. Uh, Keith, can you remind me what that's what it's called? Jumping for Jet. So uh, you guys probably saw Keith's uh, talk earlier where he talked about that, and, uh, but I just want to say thank you to the community for, uh, for literally, literally saving somebody's life here. That is how much the Wi-Fi community has impacted me and my family. So with that, let's go ahead and move on and talk about our subject today. So. Uh, and I think that this is something that it's going to take a community, that it's going to take the community, the Wi-Fi community to solve. We have a problem in the community where we've got some terms that I feel like we don't really have figured out. There's a, we've got a whole bunch of terminology that uh, there's no real clear definitions for, and I think there's a lot of confusion around it. You guys have heard uh, terms like utilization, right? And airtime and duty cycle. Now, wait a second, are those the same thing? Or are those different? No, they sound kind of similar, the concepts, but, but are they the same? Or, now, why does one tool say utilization, and why does another tool say duty cycle, and are, are they different? Are they the same thing? And, and what about channel utilization? And what about spectrum utilization? And what about airtime utilization? There's all these different terms, and I feel like we've, we've kind of got an issue here where we don't have clear definitions around these. We use them interchangeably when we could use them to define very, very specific things. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you some opinions, and they're really just opinions. I want you to decide for yourself whether I'm on track or not, or whether maybe there's something else going on here, but I'm gonna give you some opinions about what I think these all mean and how we can use these to our advantage, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of fun, uh, a little bit of fun along the way. So the first thing I wanna mention about this is whether we're talking about airtime or utilization or, um, or duty cycle, there is always a measured time span involved. We're always looking at some kind of slice of time, whether it's a slice of time slightly in the past or whether it's just the last 20 seconds or so or the last 10 seconds, we're always looking at how often something has been utilized, how often a frequency or how often a channel ha is, has been utilized. So we're always looking at some kind of rolling time span. Now in most tools, like in Ekahau, you can select between one second and 120 seconds. In, uh, in Channelizer by Medigeek, you can basically select any time span you want. There's a lot of flexibility there. And so there's a lot of different tools out there and they all offer some kind of, of different time span. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to this in a little while, but keep in mind that we've got to keep a time span in mind. So let's jump right in and talk about the first one, which is utilization. Utilization is a percentage of time that activity is detected on a frequency or channel above a certain, a certain amplitude threshold. If that sounded like a lot, we will come back to that in just a second. But I want you to keep in mind that this is a layer one, at least I think, this is a layer one measurement. This is a measurement that we take down at layer one, which is the physical layer, right? If we're thinking about an ethernet cable, the physical layer is the copper, right? It's the copper and it's the little bolts of electricity that we send back and forth down, uh, down twisted pair on ethernet. In Wi-Fi, layer one is the RF, right? It's, uh, it is the RF that we are transmitting through the air. And we're gonna measure this with a spectrum analyzer. Okay, so what if you've never touched a spectrum analyzer before? What if you've never heard the term spectrum analyzer? What's that? Well, I'm gonna go back to the very first spectrum analyzer that I ever used, which is Winamp. Anybody use Winamp back in the day? Yeah, a bunch of hands go up. 
yeah, of course, we've got the, uh, the llama whip and intro. It's, it's on mute for you know, obvious reasons. <laughs> What's that? It's got Winamp is coming back. Actually, yeah, yeah, I think I saw that in the news the other day. So Winamp had the very first spectrum analyzer that I used. It has a little audio spectrum analyzer. If you look up here in the corner of the window, that's an audio spectrum analyzer. So a few things that we can see with that, we can see how loud things are based on the height of the peaks, and we can see where in that frequency space things are happening, whether it's down in the low notes or up in the high notes. We can see, using that little spectrum analyzer, what's going on. A spectrum analyzer for Wi-Fi, instead of looking at audio spectrum, is looking at radio spectrum. It works the exact same way. So if you use Winamp, you basically know how to use a spectrum analyzer. End of presentation, any questions? Okay, no, there's a bunch more stuff to go over here. So let's talk about utilization for just a second. Well, what is utilization? Well, keep in mind, I think that the most important thing to know about Wi-Fi, the number one thing that you need to know about Wi-Fi is that on any given channel, at any given time, only one device talks one device per channel. Keith says that APs are like hubs. So whenever I see an AP, I kind of laugh because you know it's, it's a hub, right? It's a hub for wireless. In fact, somebody gave me an old ethernet hub the other day. And I thought about bringing it down and you know, holding it up and showing it, but I'm definitely gonna keep that one on the shelf at home. So if we can only have one thing talk on a channel at a time, understanding how busy that channel is, how often that channel is being used is really, really important. If the channel's only being used 10% of the time, that means there's you know, quite a bit of time left on that channel. If the channel's being used 70% of the time, there's not much left. There's not really much left on that channel to give. That channel is now saturated. So utilization tells us how often we hear things above a certain signal strength on a specific frequency or channel. How often do we hear energy on that, in, on that channel or at that frequency? So, you know, for example, if we're looking at a certain time span, so maybe this is time going in this direction, and, uh, you know, we look at maybe that's 30 seconds or so, we can, we, can basically dis, we can basically measure how often the channel has been historically used over the last 30 seconds. Maybe you want to push that time span way out to two hours and get an average. What's it been like over the last two hours? Maybe you just want to know for the last five seconds, and so you can kind of keep a really up-to-date look at what is happening on, uh, on that channel. And when we say above a certain amplitude threshold or above a certain signal strength, there is, a, there is background noise in every environment, right? If I stop talking, which I'm not going to because it's going to get super uncomfortable if I do, but if I was to stop talking and we just let the room fall to silence, you'd start to hear the HVAC, right? You'd start to hear the fan running on the guy's machine next to you who's playing Quake or something on his laptop, right? You would, uh, okay, nobody's playing Quake on their laptop. That'd, that'd be pretty cool if that was happening, but it's not. But you would hear background noise, right? You would hear the noise floor. So we have to take that measurement at a certain amplitude or a certain loudness so we can get an accurate reading of what is actually happening in the room where we're actually listening. Same for Wi-Fi devices. We need to take a measurement at a certain amplitude or loudness and measure what do we hear above that. Okay, so let's, um, so what causes utilization? Well, anything that talks in the spectrum, whether it's Wi-Fi devices that are transmitting or non-Wi-Fi devices, it doesn't matter. Cordless phones, uh, microwave ovens, baby monitors, uh, any wireless station, any access point that's transmitting, anything that chirps in the spectrum is going to cause utilization. That's what's going to cause, uh, cause utilization. So what we'll do now is we will do a not live spectrum analysis demo with the Echo House Sidekick. Instead, what I did is I just grabbed some animated GIFs to show you what's going on. So let's take a quick look at a spectrum analyzer. So a lot like Winamp, we are now looking at spectrum, and, but instead of audio spectrum, this is radio spectrum. So there's a few things that we can see here. We can see where things are happening in the spectrum, what channel or, uh, or, or what frequency things are happening on. We can see their amplitude, how loud they are. If we see a really tall spike, that means that there's something really loud right there. If we see a short spike, that means there's something relatively quiet there. But the other thing that we get is we get utilization based on color. Color tells us how often things are talking. So if you see green, that's something really, really infrequent. If you see red, that's something that's talking constantly. That's a channel or, or a frequency that is very, very busy. So those are the kind of the three things that you need to consider when you look at a, uh, when you look at a spectrum analyzer. Okay, so Let's, let's dive a little bit deeper and let's think about, let's think about spectrum utilization, let's think about utilization rather 
uh, on a percentage, from a percentage standpoint. Instead of thinking about just a color, let's think about an actual percentage. What I've got going on here is uh, I've highlighted channel 161, and uh, I have got the busiest channel just bumping up to the top of that list. And so over time, as you see things come and go here on channel 161, uh, you'll see that sometimes the channel is relatively quiet. Maybe it's green, maybe it's yellow. Sometimes the channel is really, really busy when it turns red. And it's all dependent on whatever usage is happening at that current point in time. Now I'm taking a short measurement here. This is only about a five second measurement. So we're seeing an update really, really fast. We're not getting a whole lot of historical data here. But we can see that this channel is waffling around between, uh, we can see it's waffling around between 70%, 30%, 40%, all over the place, up and down, uh, as, the, as the usage of the network ebbs and flows. And so, so you can get that measurement and see what's going on. But remember, this is looking at raw radio frequency activity. This is looking at, do we see something on the spectrum versus do we not see something in the spectrum? It's at layer one, so it's raw RF. Okay, so, uh, so channel, channel utilization, you, now we've talked about this term, right? Utilization. But then we see this other term pop up. We see channel utilization pop up. Okay, well, what does that mean? And is it different somehow? Here is the argument that I'm going to make. I'm gonna say that utilization is more of a general term. It can refer to a specific frequency. It can refer to a channel. But maybe we should think about channel utilization as an average utilization across a specific channel. If you look at uh, channel 44, what is the channel utilization averaged out across that frequency band. So think of it kind of like this. If we've got a channel here, let's just say it's 44, and uh, so there's, our, there's uh, you know, where our network would be if there was a network there, and if we have some narrow band transmitter pop up, like maybe a, uh, maybe a wireless video camera or something like that, since we're looking at the average utilization across that entire 20 megahertz channel with channel utilization, that's actually not going to show a super high utilization across the channel because that is an average across that 20 megahertz channel. So channel utilization might not be the best way to measure you know, how often this specific non-Wi-Fi device is transmitting, but it might make a really good way for us to measure how busy that channel is, how often that channel is being used on a, kind of from a 20 megahertz wide perspective. And so, that's one of the first ways that I, I kind of see these terms kind of start working together as we say utilization is a more general term. Channel utilization always refers to a specific 20 megahertz channel. So there we go. You can start to hear some of the opinions come out. And, you know, think about this stuff. Just because I'm saying it doesn't mean it's true, but this is just something that I kind of want the industry to start thinking about. Maybe we need to start settling down on, uh, on some of these terms. Okay, so let's move on to, uh, let's move on to the next uh, thing in the agenda here. Hey, iPad, wake up. Be pretty cool if you woke up. It's Wi-Fi, right? Let's see here. I think it's been doing pretty good so far, so you know, we'll give it some encouragement. Good job, little iPad, so far. Maybe it's rejecting my hand inputs or something like that. Let's see. Oh no, we tested it, we tested it, and we tested it. You guys wanna advance the next slide for me there, UC? What's that? Oh, hey, oh, there it is, cool. So how many, how many slides did we jump there? No, we didn't jump any, we're good. Let me, uh, let me close Keynote on this bad boy real quick here and open it back up. Ooh, device is unavailable. Oh man, it ruined the surprise. Apple, it always works. I'm glad I kept my Android phone around, you know? Okay, Whew, I'm not gonna touch it, we're gonna leave it alone. Okay, so let's move on to the next, the next way to think about measuring things, and this is airtime. Now we talked about utilization, right, which is a layer one measurement. Now we're moving on to layer two. Instead of looking at raw RF, we are now looking at the packet layer, or really frames. We tend to call them packets, they're really frames. I'm just gonna call them packets though, you know, whatever, it's, it's all good. I think we all know what I'm talking about. Now this is where we're gonna take a standard off-the-shelf Wi-Fi adapter or a purpose-built uh, wireless capture device of some kind and use that to capture wireless frames. Basically just to snoop on that channel and just grab anything that we hear 
on that channel. And so we are going to perform packet capture, and then we are going to perform analysis on that, just like Peter talked about just a, a few minutes ago. Now with airtime, instead of looking at how often we see raw RF in the, in the air, we are gonna look and see how much time was reserved on the air by 802.11 stations. How much time did devices reserve on the air when they wanted, wanted to talk? And so you might be wondering yourself, okay, Joel, what do you mean by reserving time? What are you talking about? Well, let me tell you. You've probably, uh, you've probably seen me talk about this before because it's one of my favorite things to talk about, which is I, I love to talk about how client devices arbitrate for airtime, how devices decide who gets to talk next. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna walk you through this process piece by piece. Now remember, how many devices talk on a channel at a time? One, one device talks on a channel at a time. So this is how we decide who gets to talk next. So what we've got here is we've got six stations over here and some of them need to talk. And so they are all going to decide who gets to talk next. Here's how. Um, station six, and time is headed this way by the way, Station six just hears, or station six just transmits some data, and there's a short little space in between, a little sift there, a little breath, <sighs> right? We take a little break between words, and then station five is going to transmit an acknowledgement, just like TCP/IP, right? We send data, we receive, we receive an acknowledgement, and now we're done. We have now ended that conversation. Now, station two and station four, they both need to talk. They both need to get on the air and say something, and so they notice they notice a little short space here called a diffs. And that diffs tells them, ooh, there's an opportunity to talk. They both know, okay, now we get to decide who gets to talk next. And in their heads, both station two and station four are going, ah, oh, man, I hate it when that happens. There's a button over on the edge. You know, the iPad thing is just not working out as well as, as it usually does today. So station, uh, station two and station four are both going to roll the dice and decide who gets to talk next. Now in its head, station two is gonna roll a seven and station four is going to roll a nine. And they are both in their own heads going to count and see if they can get all the way through that without the channel being used by another device. So now they're going to silently count in their own heads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now station two counted all the way up to seven and nothing talked. And so it goes, cool, I counted up to seven and nothing talked, so I'm gonna go ahead and talk. So it's going to transmit a request to send to seek access to the medium. Meanwhile, station four counted up as well, five, six, seven, eight, ah, oh, something else started talking before me, so now I have to back off and I have to wait for my turn to talk. So when station two transmits that request to send, that basically broadcasts a signal to the entire channel. It says, hey, everybody on the channel, shut up for this much time. It tells everything to shut up. They all synchronize their watches and set what's called a nav timer. And everything obeys that nav timer and backs off until they have an opportunity to talk. So now station one's gonna reply with a, a clear to send. Station two is gonna transmit its data. And then station one is going to reply with the acknowledgement. And now we are done. We have now finished our little conversation and they have finished up that little slice of time that they reserved. Now remember how station four rolled a nine and got interrupted at seven? Well, it remembers that and it saved its remaining two back off slots. And so now it says, okay, well I have two slots remaining, so I'm just gonna use those up. And so it counts one, two, cool, it's my turn to talk. And so it goes ahead and transmits. Meanwhile, station two rolled a 10, didn't get access to the medium because station four beat it out. So the thing that I want you to take away from this is that there is a finite amount of time available on each channel and devices constantly go through this process whenever they wanna transmit, even if an access point wants to transmit a beacon, it has to look for an opportunity to talk and take that opportunity to talk. So for us as wireless network engineers, a really important measurement that we need to have access to is how busy is the channel? How often is the channel being used? And yes, we can look at that from a utilization standpoint, but now we have another way to look at that. We can look at that from an airtime perspective, how much airtime is being used. So what causes airtime airtime usage. Well, 802.11 devices that need to transmit, obviously, they're going to cause airtime usage, but things that are going to increase airtime usage and make things less efficient, consume more time on the air, are of course more devices. You cram more devices onto a coverage cell, that's gonna increase airtime usage. You, uh, uh, you, you use slower data rates. If you allow devices to talk slower, it takes longer for them to transmit. You guys see what I'm getting out there? Driving myself crazy just doing that. 
Devices that slow down to slower data rates take longer to transmit the same amount of data. That's why we try to keep eight access points and, uh, and client devices really close together so they can hit nice, fast data rates. That's why we disable legacy protection mechanisms and disable 802.11b data rates. That's to force everything to talk faster. And, so, uh, and then also retries. If we transmit something and we have to transmit it again, if we transmit something and we have to transmit it again, see what I did there, pretty clever, no, not really, then that's gonna take more time, right? That's gonna consume more time on the air on that, uh, on that uh, specific channel. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna perform a, uh, well, not a live packet capture, but, oh, shoot, uh, hey, UC, where are you? You back there somewhere? Where'd he go? Well, I need to ask UC, uh, oh, there you are. Hey, uh, do you mind if I show him the thing? I, oh, I, we can't? What? Oh, oh, I'm not really mad about you giving my sidekick to someone else. That's not a big deal. Um, not really, I guess it is kind of a big deal, but that's not what this is about. I just accidentally put it up there. What's that? No? Yeah, but, but they already know because I accidentally put it on the slide. So can I just, I'm just gonna, is that, I'm just gonna show it. I'll, I'll talk to you later, okay? I'm just gonna show it, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you later. I'll, I'll talk to Miko later too, hopefully. So, okay, so uh, what I'm gonna show you now is, you guys know what the Echo House Sidekick is, right? You guys know what that is? Who, who doesn't know what the Echo House Sidekick is? Yeah, there's some applause. Okay, so uh, the Sidekick is a wearable thing that we make for doing, uh, that we, we, we make for doing wireless site surveys, and there's always been this really kind of obvious thing that we haven't done, which is do wireless packet capture with it. And uh, I accidentally just kind of spilled the beans about that. Sorry, UC. But I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like today so you guys can see what this, lo this looks like. Now, it's, it's not exactly out yet, but it will be really soon. Uh, and I guess I just kind of uh, announced it. I hope I have a job tomorrow. We'll see. Okay, so uh, so this is what the uh, the Echow Capture utility looks like. And by the way, this runs great on on Windows and Mac OS. So basically, what you get is uh, you get this little window where you can select a channel. And in fact, the the Sidekick has two radios, which is kind of nice. So now you can select two channels. So we could grab, for example, channel one and channel 165 and and capture on both of those channels. Really nice for comparing what airtime utilization looks like on a couple of different channels or really nice for, uh, for capturing on, I don't know, maybe uh, one channel and another channel to anticipate a roaming event, to catch a client device roaming from one AP to the other. Another place where this came in really handy is I was at a hotel and I was troubleshooting my own wireless connection at a hotel. You guys do that too, right? Yeah. And uh, I couldn't tie up my MacBook's Wi-Fi after to do packet capture, so I just used the Sidekick. I now had this nice you know, third device that I could use. So anyway, if we take a packet capture, with a sidekick or with a MacBook or whatever it is that you have, now we get a PCAP file. And this is just a standard off-the-shelf PCAP file that we can throw into Wireshark or IPA or OmniPeak or whatever wireless packet analysis tool you want to use. Now, I love Wireshark a lot, but one thing that Wireshark, it, it's, a, it's not really great for doing is showing me how much airtime is used. Sure, I can take a look at individual duration values. I can see how, how much time each individual frame consumed on the medium, like this little uh, 40 microsecond frame versus uh, you know, this uh, 1,000 microsecond frame right there. We can kind of get an idea of how much time each frame is consuming, but it doesn't really give us a good overall look at the health of a channel. And so my favorite tool for doing that, as a lot of you know, is, uh, is IPA. This is a tool by the guys at, uh, at MetaGeek that I, I really, really like this tool because it shows you airtime usage across an entire channel. It basically calculates who used how much time, what they did to consume that time, how often they had to retransmit, re uh, how fast or how slow they talked. And so, for example, a couple of things that we can see here is when we look at this little time span right there, so see, there we go, we're looking at a small time span, we could see, well, there was some guy with a one plus there that was consuming any airtime that was used during that little segment of time. You can look at it and see, oh yeah, there was a one plus device and it averaged this data rate and it had this many retries. You can look at that and see, or you could shift to a different time span entirely and go, oh, hey, there was a MacBook Pro that swallowed up a whole bunch of airtime here. And so with a packet analysis tool, you can really drill down into this stuff and see how much airtime was being used. Is it the same as utilization? No, no, it's not quite the same thing, 
but it's very closely linked. They're not the same thing, but they are very closely coupled. If you see airtime utilization go up, you, or it, see now I'm doing it. If you see airtime go up, you're gonna see utilization go up as well. So there, that's the differences between those is basically what layer they live in. So now I'm gonna tackle the very last one that I wanna talk about today, almost, which is duty cycle. Now I've seen in a lot of spectrum analysis tools out there, some of them say utilization, some of them say spectrum utilization, some of them say channel utilization, some of them say airtime utilization, and some of them say duty cycle. And this has really bugged me for a long time. And so I've asked a few engineers, I've asked a few people, and I've looked around in a few manuals and things to find out what, what is duty cycle exactly? Well, what I've come up with is that duty cycle is the percentage of time that a transmitter is active. The difference here is that we're not looking at a whole frequency or a whole channel. We're not just listening to everyone. We are targeting a specific device. How much is that device talking right now? How much is that device talking right now? And I don't really know the details about this, but I think there are some spectrum analyzers out there, like maybe a Cognio card, that can figure out what the, the, what the, the, uh, the duty cycle of a specific device is. I don't really know that for sure. But I think that this term, when used correctly, refers to how often a specific device is active. We can actually think about this outside of the realm of, of Wi-Fi. This is a term that's, that's all over the place. So to illustrate this, uh, we'll do a little demo with the Ekahal Saga, I mean an Arduino. We'll use an Arduino to, uh, to look at this and see what duty cycle looks like. So here's what I did. Um, I went over to uh, Fry's Electronics and uh, I grabbed a few LEDs and I grabbed a, a little uh, Arduino knockoff board. Ooh, I really hope that doesn't fall. That would be really interesting. And I put together this little, this little box that will, that will basically show us duty cycle on a set of LEDs. And so what we've got here is a button, and we can use that button to change the duty cycle for these three green LEDs right here. So I chose green because I figure all you guys are used to looking at green blinking lights, is that correct? Yeah? And you might ask, well, why does it have three green LEDs? MIMO, right? So we've got our three green LEDs, and then we've also got uh, an indicator here for when I put the push uh, a button to change our duty cycle. And then I've also got this one here, which doesn't do anything because it caught on fire in my hotel room last night, literally let the magic smoke out of it. I don't know what I did. <laughs> I plugged in, poof, oh boy. So I left it on there because I figured it'd be kind of entertaining. So probably, hopefully no more fire, uh, no more fire this morning. So uh, this might be kind of hard for some of you to see. Uh, Earlier, there was a distribution of way more people over there, but now it's kind of evened out, so I'm not going to move it. So hopefully you guys can see this, but I'm just going to plug this little guy in real quick here. And now we have three LEDs here. Can you guys see that at all? Oh, yeah, you guys can see it? All right, cool. So we can see there's three little LEDs there, and they are blinking 10%. Ah, thank you for lowering the house lights. They are blinking 10% of the time. 10% of the time they are off, 90% of the time. 10% uh, of the time they are on, 90% of the time they are off. Their duty cycle right now is 10%. So if I hit the, hit the button a few times, it's gonna increment by 10% each time. And this is awful, by the way. Uh, in, I, like, I didn't have like a, a pull down resistor for this button, and so I just used an LED, which I think is why it died, and ugh, this is terrible. Um, I, I've been trying to convince UC to let me come work on the development team for forever, and uh, he, took one, he took one look at this and said, no, not gonna happen. So. Yeah, I tried. I wrote nice code and everything. Well, kind of nice code. I don't know. It's a mess. So we'll hit the button a couple of times here, and we're going to pick that up to about, that's about 50%. That's about a 50% duty cycle. Now, you're probably starting to have a little bit of trouble even differentiating between blinks. You can probably still see that it's blinking, but at some point, persistence, persistence of vision is going to take over, and you will lose track that things are even blinking at all. So let's hit the button a couple more times here. Now we are right up at 90% utiliza or 90% duty cycle. So those lights are blinking 90% of the time and only off 10% of the time. It's kind of getting hard to tell that they're even blinking at all, right? And of course, when we hit it one more time, now we are, uh, now we are at 100% duty cycle. That device is transmitting from its little, little antennas that work in the visible spectrum to your eyeballs, which you know, also work in the visible spectrum. So, Anyway, that's my little example just for fun. I figure you guys are geeks like me, hopefully, I hope, uh, that, uh, that might enjoy that a little bit. So, and then, we, of course, if we hit the button again, now we jump back down to only 10%. So, 
if you look on Wikipedia, if you look at the FCC and how they define duty cycle, uh, if you look at uh, some engineering documentation, things like that, what I have found so far is that duty cycle always refers to how often a specific device, a specific device is powered on versus powered off. That, and so my, um, and so what I'm proposing is that when we say duty cycle, when we say duty cycle, we are referring to a singular device. When we say utilization, we are referring to anything that is talking on a specific frequency or channel. When we say airtime, we are, we are referring to layer two, how often layer two is busy versus not busy. But then there's a few leftovers that we need to kind of clean up here. So we, we talked about utilization, we talked about airtime, we talked about duty cycle. What about channel utilization and spectrum utilization and airtime utilization. There are, uh, uh, there are a lot of, uh, of outliers here. And so let's just see if we can clean things up a little bit here before we, uh, before we end our time together. I'm gonna say that channel utilization, that seems like utilization averaged across a channel. We talked about that earlier. I think if we say utilization, we should be referring, we, we could use that as a more general term, but if we say channel utilization, that needs to be for a specific a specific channel. Um, if we see spectrum utilization, I'm gonna say that the spectrum is, we probably just don't need it. We probably don't need to say spectrum utilization, just like we don't need to say the W in, that's why we, we don't need to say WAP, right? It's an AP, right? Do they make wired APs? No, it's an AP, right? We don't need to say WAP. I think there's kind of something similar going on here where we don't really need to say spectrum utilization. We know that utilization is in the spectrum, but if, you, if I did see that, I think I would know exactly what it means. And then there's airtime utilization. Is that airtime? Is that utilization? I'm not really sure, so maybe we should consider calling that just airtime. So that is, uh, those are just my opinions, and uh, what I want you guys to keep in mind is that this is just my opinion. This is not an industry standard, but I just want to get the conversation started to see if maybe we can start moving in that direction for kind of being standardized about how we use our terminology and uh, where we use it, what we use it for. And so I hope that helps. So any questions or anything before I uh, jump off the stage, before people throw tomatoes at me? All right, cool. So uh, yeah, maybe one last closing thing before I, before I have you back up on the stage here, Tom. Um, this, this will be published by CWMP, right, the, the slides? Yeah, so I put a table here at the end. Uh, you've ever been on a phone call where it's like, huh, that phone call, uh, or that phone call could have been an email. Well, maybe this presentation could have been a table. And so uh, uh, that will come out with those slides and I'll probably post that on the internet somewhere. Maybe I'll stick that on Twitter here in a few minutes. So any questions or anything before I jump off the stage? All right, perfect. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it.